right, all right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the West Cliff Climb. We are sorry for the brief delay here coming to you live from a hotel lobby in San Marcos. Uh, just a quick snag that we had to get around, get over and get through. So all that being said, I'm so pleased to be joining my friend, Dr. Paul Looney. Paul, how in the heck are you, buddy? Doing great. Thank you. It's a, Doing it's a uh, beautiful day, although a bit hot and muggy. That's it. Hot and muggy and uh, boundaries, 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 right? So if my kid says, dad, it's hot and muggy outside. I know that I want to put on a solid wool sweater and uh, and ski pants. Uh, I should tell him those two magical letters put together that form one short, beautiful word, as you talked about in your video, simply called no. Well, the of course, in of that, no. yeah, in that event, I might actually <laughs> let my kid find out more naturally the consequences of his or her choice, because it's not particularly dangerous to sure. wear those clothes in, in hot weather. So sometimes it's really good to let kids um, test the limits and find out there's a reason for them rather than sparing them those uh, consequences all the time. So for those of you that may be getting caught up on like, that was the strangest intro ever. Uh, actually, I'm already referencing the awesome video. I, I, I watched it twice. I loved it. I loved it. Very well done. Um, talk to us about the inspiration for those that are still trying to get caught up on uh, the heart and the mind behind the video that you, uh, you put out this week. So the video was entitled Dying to Self. And it relates to a passage in Romans chapter seven, where Paul says, when the law came, I died. And what I reference in the video is that, that all of us come into the world with a sense of boundless opportunity. If we right. have a loving mother, she is the fount of every good thing. And she's always at the ready to right. meet my need, to respond to my desire, the cry of my heart. And it is a beautiful thing to see a mother minister to her child right that child doesn't really know where he stops and mom starts um the child feels that there is this perfect attunement and a sense of absolute autonomy too that i can do whatever i want have whatever i want um with a short wait generally the world will conform to my wishes and it's it's a beautiful thing for a time However, what I propose in the video is that, that that time needs to be limited, that our normal, our sort of healthy narcissism, feeling that we're yeah. the center of the world, needs to come crashing down at a certain point. Otherwise, we will be a terrible person to live with. <laughs> well, and, you know, interestingly, interestingly enough, I realized that it was Mother's Day, leading up to Mother's Day, that we kind of did kind of a Father's Day bend like um you know content we put out and it was cool so now here we're, we're creeping up on father's day and we're kind of leaning the other way which i dig way to go right way to go westcliff um because what i think you you're touching on too and i'd love for you to respond and grab and, and give us added insight is we're all we're made in the image of god we're image bearers of god yes and amen and this side of a of a mother to a child is also revealing other aspects of God, his character, and how he relates to us. You know, we call him father. Yes and amen. But there are these sides of his nurturing who he is and nurturing his kids. Speak, speak some more on that, on that connection as well, if you would. Sure. Well, early in scripture, um, God is often referred to as El Shaddai, which, which some people feel has that sense of mother and father in, in, in the character of God. And that it, early on in his, the way that he related with Adam and Eve, he was really like a mom to Adam and Eve and didn't say no with one particular exception. But they could be naked and unashamed. They could be free to express whatever they felt um, in that garden experience. And so God does give us all when we first come to him that sense of nurturing, that yeah. sense of compassion, that sense yeah. of attunement um, and, and responsiveness to our pleas. And then he doesn't. And so, right. so we, we, we have the law, these limits that come into our experience to demonstrate to us that 
there are certain realities that cannot be transgressed without consequence. Um, gravity, for instance, is something that if you, you know, when you fall down, it's going to carry you to <laughs> a sudden right. stop. And right. that sudden stop is going to hurt if you fall from any height. And so, so children have to learn the limits, both natural limits and spiritual, emotional, relational limits, if they're going to be as successful in navigating the challenges of life on the planet, particularly the challenges of being in relationship with other people. When, if all of us were determined to have our own desire or exert our own will, no matter what, the yeah. world would be just a hideous place to live in. Right. And, and so even this idea, I wondered, you know, what I started to take from it is without, you know, folks and parents having clear boundaries that like what that looks like without that, we're really hindered from ever becoming sacrificial human beings living for something bigger and outside of ourselves. I mean, I, unless I just totally misinterpreted your video, that's what the first thing that hit me is like, wow, what's at stake is if we don't draw those kind of boundaries in our homes, our children will never quite, or they will be set behind at, at the very least, how to be sacrificial human beings. Right. Well, um, sacrificing is, is painful. And it's one of the beautiful things about sacrifice that it does cost us. At the heart of love or every loving relationship is that willingness to sacrifice, right. to step outside my comfort, to comfort someone else, to give something that I could claim for my own, to bless another. That right. willingness to surrender something precious my right. attention, my time, my affection, to surrender that for the benefit of another person is at the essence and the heart of loving relationship. And moms demonstrate that to children. But what we know is that just getting all of that from mom does not create in me by itself this automatic determination to give to others the, right. what, what they need. We have to come up against the, the limitations of our own self-will in order to really grieve this lack or loss of perfect attunement and autonomy. Right. Um, we, we long for both of those things and we're made in the image of God. We're made for love and we're made for freedom. So right. both of those things are deeply held values. And when we feel like mom is withholding love because she won't give me the cookie before dinner right. or um, she's limiting my freedom or my autonomy to put whatever I want in my mouth or run into the street or the parking lot. <laughs> Those moments, I, I, I desperately want to have my way. And I protest strongly against those <laughs> limits. Right. But if, if the limits are firm, then my tantrum or my protestation will eventually um, wear itself out. And I'll come back to a place of calm where I can hear once again from the voice of reason. And mom can tell me why I can't play in the street, why I can't have the cookie before mealtime. But when self-will is at work, my brain does not hear logic. It only yeah. hears self-will. Well, so then like, what about, I was thinking about this listening to your video. What can a person in in their existence get this idea but still wherever they're at in their journey with christ spiritually not be there yet can that can that coexist in a human being where they don't understand quite that um there is something bigger than them in the matters of the heart and faith as it relates to jesus but at the same time they can live a life that's sacrificial with the people around them i mean what does that look like in that that kind of that collision as a person's developing? And is that possible? Do you see that? How does that manifest itself? I'm not sure I completely understand what you're asking. Are you asking if a person can be a believer and not really understand the need for sacrifice and dying to self? I'm saying like it like like in, in my life, I, I may deal with um, folks that maybe are spiritually are just infants. <laughs> <laughs> in right. every sense of the word, right? Yeah. But um, at the same time, they appear as though they understand the reality of 
serving and sacrificing those that are around them. So spiritually, they, they haven't they haven't wrapped like that side of their being around that. In every right. other way, though, it's manifesting itself. Uh, at least it seems to be, and that's why I was curious. What what do you see? What do you what do you think about that? Sure. Well, some of what we do and that looks like sacrifice is really self serving. Um, it makes us feel good to be needed, to be wanted, to um, to be seen as um, altruistic or right. uh, sacrificial. So for some of what we do is driven not by true death to self. It's driven by my need to be needed or to look right. good. Um, and go. so you can see the behaviors that look like sacrificial giving which in reality are pot could be posturing or um, just be trying to play the hero. And that's where, you know, brokenness is something that we cannot orchestrate for ourselves. Um, right. and that's why moms have to <laughs> have to be there for us. Dads, sometimes the government, um, our own bodies sometimes will bring us to a place of brokenness or our own sin or addictions. But brokenness is what allows us to, surrender that need to feel control that need to feel like i've got this um yeah. i can get what i if i want it bad enough i can get what i want we have to come to that place where we want something desperately and something that we see as fundamentally good and come up short yeah. in order to really feel our brokenness that's really what the work of the Holy Spirit it does that for us. And, and, and you're right. People can be believers, but not having come yet to that place of, of, of complete and utter brokenness. With Paul, it, it was partly his thorn in the flesh that brought him to that place where he says, now I delight in weakness, in infirmity, in hardship, because when I am weak, then I am strong. Yeah. I, I can say in our home, uh, and man, my wife is just awesome in this category. Mallory is awesome in this way. Because to me, our, our kids are so cute. And like we have a two-year-old. She's just a little tiny two foot of cute. Top to bottom. Just cute. Yeah. But she's she's a little center. So there's little things that she's already trying to, you know, get away with. And, you know, we'll have these conversations like, a little sometimes it's even a little bit funny and i have to walk out of the room and like not let her see that she's really killing me right now she's destroying my credibility as a parent if i stand there and look at her because i won't be able to keep it together but but you know you talk about like you know outside of that that 18 month period in and around there being able to draw that line with a kid lovingly and, and let them throw their little tantrum and let them run into it and i, I guess on the heels of that what i was curious is can a person grow up and they're just out of control? There was no boundaries. And can they make that change later developmentally? Or are they really in an uphill battle for the rest of their lives? Like what's that window that well, once Jesus, it closes? Yeah. If you if you think about Jesus' words to Nicodemus, Nicodemus was someone who from a from a religious, spiritual, emotional, relational uh, political point of view was at the top of his game. He was yeah. put to, he was put together, um, but to to him and maybe Nicodemus needed to experience some brokenness. Jesus' words were very clear: Nicodemus, you must be born again. And that rebirth is what puts us in a relationship with a father who, unlike our earthly father, is not afraid. To discipline us when we need us need it. Yeah. Who is not withholding of compassion and tenderness when we desire it? Who is who is fully capable of giving us um, manifest evidence of his love without coddling us, without um, pandering to our self will? And so, if Nicodemus or any of us take up Jesus on his um, command to be born again. We will, in our relationship with God, experience bonding and brokenness and yeah. yielding and uh, pursuit. We'll we'll go through those tasks of development that we did in, in our humanity, but we'll do them in a deeper, fuller, and more uh, profound way. Love it, love it, and that is a beautiful segue 
to our next video. Just want to remind you guys, for those of you that are checking us out, uh, you look at a little ticker tape at the bottom. That'll tell you everything you need you need to know about myself, um, uh, Dr. Paul and Tavarius as well. Check out their ministries. Get behind them. Champion those things. They're beautiful gifts to the ministry and to folks that uh, really need a helping hand mentally, emotionally, physically, relationally, spiritually. All good things. I uh, want to jump to the second video because uh, really what I realized is uh, and it has to do with, with, with their mother. Uh, my daughter's going to be beautiful. I know it. She's going to be beautiful. And I thought, you know what? I can't shoot every guy that tries to date her. I, I can't do it. Right. That's I, how, how's that supposed to work? So I thought, you know what? I need to make sure she knows how to handle herself. So we, we started to get her into Krav Maga and that's good. She's getting her punches out on, on a pad rather than her brother's face. This it's all, it's all working very well. Um, and I got to know the guy that started it, Level 6 Krav Maga, awesome place. They have an awesome kids teaching. And when I really started picking Dan Sartain's just brain about his life, I love hearing people's story. And it's a great way to learn about their faith and their walk with Jesus or share Jesus with them. It's just tell me about your story, you know. And uh, it was one of those type things where he was a wild man. And uh, it was interesting because I, I, I guess I never really thought of it, you know not knowing who you are, your identity, your value, your worth. In his case, as he got older and tougher, it manifests itself in trying to dominate others and just yeah. beat the mess out of other people. Right. And so what's interesting is there was this period in his life that before he got really good at, at fighting, he is walking away from fights and people are thinking it's because he's meek. No, he's not. He's afraid. Yeah ironically this is what blew my mind more with him and i got to talk when he's in the phase of life where he's just beating people up you know like just you know he is also doing that out of fear so he's he's doesn't know who he is it's driving all of it whatever it looks like on the surface that's not what it is he doesn't know his worth his value he, he actually is a person existing in fear and his walk with Jesus happened later in life. And it is that Nicodemus type thing that you're talking about. Because if you met him now, he's just just a, a meek man. You can tell there's power. But I thought, you know, meekness is so often misunderstood. And I wanted to help people understand this constrained power. Yeah. Having the ability to crush someone in any, whatever it is, you know, intellectually you know, mentally, emotionally, relation, whatever, and to be constrained power um, right. and a beautiful work of Jesus. What's your thoughts? Well, um, I think the two videos work so well together because we are driven by fear until we die. Like mm. fear of death drives a lot of um, activity, movement away from things that are scary, movement toward things that we, we think will give us control. And so th this idea of dying to self actually awakens us to curiosity. When we're afraid, we back away from things. When we have no fear, we move toward those very things. And we, we have this curious, open, teachable attitude. And, and the idea of meekness, which um, Jesus encapsulated in the third beatitude, is the idea of being teachable, being yielded and receptive to direction so yeah. that the person who is truly meek um, knows his or her place in the world knows um, their power and their limitations and they can they can rein themselves in because right. they've died to self-will they they're not at the mercy of their impulses or their fears they're able to be surrendered yielded and meek it's the most beautiful thing Wow. And, and that was the thing I hear them tell our, the, the kids all the time is they're cultivating an attitude of, of what you just touched on, of no fear of the bad guy. No fear. But at the same time, you do not leverage what we're teaching you in any other way, shape or form. It's to protect the people around you and the people you love. And and so just that idea. And I thought, you know, what's so incredible, the last 12 hours of Jesus's life you see this constrained power. Like, yeah. I know you all think you're in control. 
I know you all feel like you fixed the score and rigged the whole thing. Pilot, I just want you to know, you know, I can, I can rain down fury right now. I'm handing myself to you and leveraging all of your little hangups and hatreds and all these folks and, you know, just pushing all those buttons right. brilliantly yeah. to make this thing happen. And I think it blows my mind of just the depth of God's love is that he would use people's fear and hatred against him. He would allow that to happen so that the opportunity would even exist for them to be redeemed from their yeah. fear and hatred. Yeah. yeah. That's mind blowing. You know, it, it truly is. Josh, the, um, the, the, the truth is that Jesus wants us to stand firm um, mm. for righteousness in, in our faith. When he says, if, if an evil man per hits you, turn the other cheek, or they take your cloak, get, give them your coat as well. There, Jesus is, is suggesting that the ultimate display of power is to, um, to yield um rather than to exert control yeah um the, the the apostle paul i believe says do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil by doing good and this the essence of meekness really is being able to surrender my desire for control to god and let him show up in that place of meekness um, and show his splendor show his power and it's 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 quite actually startling to people when they see your lack of fear, um, mm. and when 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 you're in a situation where uh, people are trying to strike fear at you and you have no fear, it's often very disarming for them because their their plan is not going as predicted. Right. I, and I believe, I, I think it was just a conversation you and I had. I don't even know that it was on the, the previous podcast is, is I believe you were telling me that when fear sets in for a person, we either have greatly hindered or even maybe even, I think you may have said, you can correct me here or potentially lose the ability to reason at that point. So if you become afraid really afraid you you run the risk of some way shape or form of turning off your ability to assess rightly what's even happening around you anymore you just kind of yeah, become yeah. a mindless sheep yeah. sort of yeah. so, so, the, so when we feel threat um the 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 sympathetic nervous system kicks in and generally we think of fight and flight but right. we also go to freeze which is what you're touching on josh is that sometimes we when we are uh horribly afraid we shut down our our brains and we're like that deer in the headlights where we don't get out of harm's way because we're frozen in that fear um if if we're if we're better equipped to manage that threat then we're going to run away or we're going to power up and fight but death to self enables a completely different possibility and that is neither fighting nor fleeing nor freezing but simply, simply staying firm, like yeah. staying grounded in who I am and who I'm called to be by the one who has ultimate control. That's what meekness is. Is not uh, it's it, it's power under control. One of the one of the beautiful uh, examples of healing in Jesus' ministry was to a centurion who had a servant who was sick, and and he came and and the the people around him said hey this is a good guy jesus you should you should help him and so he's and so jesus indicates to the guy he's going to go to his house and heal his servant and, and the, the the centurion says no 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 i am not worthy to have you come to me he says i am a man under authority and i say to this one go and he goes and this one come and he comes when i first read that that read that passage i thought doesn't he mean i'm a man of authority not a man under authority but this centurion understood meekness in a, right. in a very fundamental way he understood that his ability to exert power was being under authority being under wow. power and so yeah. power under control is is this it's this idea that if i am rightly aligned with the powers that be whether it be um 
uh, Matthew, the tax collector under the power of Rome, or the Christian, the believer under operating under the power of God, that's where the flow of authority comes. That's where yeah. I have power under control because I'm surrendered control. Love it. Love it. You know, a, a friend of mine had, had got me turned on to a uh, kind of modern day philosopher, Rene Girard. Uh, luckily, they uh, some of his stuff's in English. Otherwise, it would have been lost. Whole thing. Otherwise, <laughs> most of his writings were in French. And but he makes some really fascinating connections that once I dove into some of his works as how this thing of, about fear plays itself out, that if you have something that's opposed that that kind of poses as a threat to your identity. If if you take on a disposition of fear, you are more likely than at some point to take opposition and then two, the two sides when it's all said and done actually run the risk of of kind of mirroring each other. In other words, you 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 aren't necessarily if, if you're governed by fear and something feels like a threat, feels like a hostile threat, you're more apt to then take on a, a hostile disposition yourself. And mm -hmm. thus, what's who wins ultimately is Satan, because the net result is it's just two groups that have two different names, two different whatever. But basically, right. they become the same thing. Yeah, and yeah. so his whole point was, what trips that up? What yeah. trips that up is the gospel. What yeah. trips that up is the work of Jesus. And then what? Because he's calling us to something so radical that when something poses in this way, rather than just being driven by fear, or hatred and becoming the exact same thing in a mirror. Actually, we become meek. Yeah, we we die so, to self. You know. Yeah. So in in the toddler uh, illustration, the toddler is pushing against the uh, the other uh, individual that they're in relationship with. Yeah. Um, and 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 what you're pointing out is this: that human tendency is when we feel um, threat or oppression that we want to power up. But um, rather than entering into judgment and rejection or rebellion, the right. meek person is, is free to choose his or her response. And so when Pilate says to Jesus, aren't you going to defend yourself? Like, aren't you going to do the normal thing when you're threatened right. with, <laughs> with death? Aren't you going to defend yourself? Jesus is like, hmm, no. No, he doesn't. Yeah. He, he doesn't speak a word because he de has no need to defend um, in a situation where he knows God is ultimately in control. And that's that's what you pointed out. He he says to Pilate, "You have no power except what's been given you." That's and it. So when we understand power, when we understand authority, when we understand surrender and death yeah. to self, we have the freedom to respond in a way that that is completely under the control of the Holy Spirit and not under the control of our survival instincts. Love it. And because I, I also think when we look at that idea of meek and Jesus, to me, it makes him accessible. Hmm. It's like power. You know, if, if he just would have crushed Pilate and the whole story was different, you know, and then God said, you're right, you know, and then here comes 10,000 angels. Yeah. I think I think we would exist in a way where maybe our behavior would look well and look right, but we would live in fear of, is he going to rain down? And him being meek is like, wow, he has the power to save and he has perfect judgment. He uses it well. He wields it well. And I feel like I can come to him and talk to him and let him, and he, he approach me and we can do this thing. And I don't have to live in fear because he's meek. What exactly. say you? So, what say you? Yeah. I had to get that in. There it is. And so, so perfect segue to Matthew 11, where Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, because take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, because I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest right on. for your souls. And so Jesus says, yes, I have the power of the universe at my disposal, but I, I make no pretensions. I, I make no assumptions. Yeah. I don't power up. I am meek and lowly in heart. I'm fully content to let my father, my loving father, call the shots for me, to do only what he asks of me. That's where I live. And it's a place of rest. It's a place of peace. It's a place of joy. And that's, you, you're, you're saying that you know, Jesus becomes accessible. We yeah. can come to him. 
because yeah. he is meek and lowly. It's yeah. beautiful. Well, that's called a bow. You put a bow on it. It's that's <laughs> that's it. There's there's nothing to add at this point, guys. We want to let you all know we love you out there. Thank you so much for tuning in, interacting with us. We love this opportunity. It's truly a joy for us. Uh, Paul, I would love it if you'd close us out in prayer. Mm, thank you, Josh. God, we acknowledge you as the source of all good, the source of all wisdom, the source of all power. And God, we yield to you. We know that that our hum humanity is driven by survival instincts to keep us safe. And we need those when we're maturing. But at a certain point, you ask us to die to self-protection that we might live to you, to die to self-will that we might surrender to your will. And God, we invite you to be our father. Jesus says, call no one on earth your father because you have one father in heaven. And as Father's Day approaches, God, we acknowledge you as the father from whom all fathers flow and as the one to whom all souls must ultimately go. We love you and we yield to you today. We ask that you give us the meekness that Jesus embodied in his precious name. Amen. Amen. Folks, we love you out there. Uh, have a blessed week. Until next time. Bye.